I'm Alan Kogan. Join me as I tour the country tasting different whiskeys and discussing the craft of distillation with local distillers, whiskey lovers, and even those who are new to the culture of spirits. Welcome to The Kogan Conversation. Hey everyone, in this episode I had the pleasure of sitting down with Owen King from Ironclad Distillery Company, located in Newport News, Virginia. Ironclad is a family-run craft distillery reveling in the rich Civil War history of the area. The distillery actually sits along the James River within view of the first ironclad battle site of the American Civil War. Just a couple quick notes before the show. This is our last episode of 2023. So if you like this episode and others we've done, do me a favor and leave me a rating and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I'd appreciate subscribing to our YouTube channel as well. We have lots of awesome stuff planned for 2024, including an eventual shift to a full video format show. With that, Let's get to the episode with Ironclad. Enjoy. All right, Owen, well, thank you for having me here at the Ironclad Distillery. Welcome here, Kogan. Yeah, I hey, I, I've never been here, and you've already corrected me. It's Newport News, not Newport. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta say it with a kind of southern draw, too. Newport News. Newport News. Well, so tell me about the distillery. How long has it been here, and uh, how'd you get involved? Yeah, so uh, the distillery started about nine years ago now. Um, my dad owns this 30,000 square foot warehouse that we're currently in. Um, and, uh, so it's, it's three stories, it's 10,000, 10,000 square feet each floor. Um, and he bought it 16, 17 years ago now. Um, and he had another business operating out of here. And so as busy as that other business ever was, we were never filling the entire building. And so, uh, you know, after I graduated college, I, I came down, uh, he are, he nice, graciously offered me a job. So I came down to work for him because, you know. After college, you need a job. Uh, so came down to work for him. And uh, we had already all always really enjoyed drinking bourbon and, and uh, you know, sitting around talking about drinking bourbon and, think, <laughs> and talking about it. Uh, you know, all those good, all the good conversations you have, all that having bourbon with you. Um, and so we were talking about what we were going to do with all the extra space we have. And, you know, he had this I had this idea of, of you know, making it in a tons and tons of crazy ideas <laughs> and so uh you know one day he's like you know like, you know what we could do we could start a bourbon distillery and you know, we can we can make the bourbon and um and we could store it on the floor on this on the on the you know floors we're not using and um and as as you know when we get busy in the in the restoration business which was what his business was um, you know, we'll, we'll slow down, we will slow down production on the bourbon, but when we, when we're slow in the, in the, um, uh, restoration business, we'll really go full bore, uh, bourbon distilling. And so we're like, oh yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Uh, and you know, kind of forgot about it. And a couple weeks later I walked in he's like, oh, by the way, I bought a still. And I was like, oh, great. We're bootleggers now. Uh, this is, this is going to be great. Um, so we, the still showed up and, uh, and we are like, oh, what are we going to do? It was a little 26 gallon hillbilly still. And, uh, we looked into the legality of owning a still and it turns out, you know, you can own a still, but you if, to use it, it's on hundred percent illegal. So we went through and we're like, well, if we're going to do this, we might as well do it legally and not go to jail for, for bootlegging. <laughs> um, and so we, you know, it took us about a year to get all of our licenses and permits and everything. And then we started distilling and, um, we did it for, we, we've been doing it for a while and, uh, we were really enjoying the distilling and not so much the restoration business. So he sold the restoration business and, uh, we went full-time distillery, making it, uh, making it a you know, legitimate business and, uh, really enjoying it. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been enjoying watching you, you guys grow. I, I've, I've only been here for a few years in Virginia and I've had just a, a couple of your, of your bottles before, but, uh, this is the first time at the distillery. And this space is such a cool space too. You have the distillery, of course, but then you have, I mean, we're sitting here in a little speakeasy and we have, you have the, the big tasting room area in, in the front. Uh, tell me a little bit about that, about the space you're in. So we, I mean, when we started the bourbon distillery, um, we were really lucky in the fact that my sister uh, didn't love her job in New York. And so she was getting really burnt out of being up there and she wanted to come down and a little change of pace. And so she wanted to come and be a bourbon brat and she wanted to, to help with the, help start the distillery. And so, um, so she has a, she's a marketing whiz. Uh, she's been working in New York and in, in fashion and, and marketing and copywriting. 
Um, and so she thought she could come down and do all of our marketing for us and, and really getting the brand out there. And so uh, we when we finally got to the point where we were actually able to sell things, because, uh, you know, we had to let all the stuff age that we were making. Um, she really hit the ground running. She had a great uh, design or idea for packaging. She had a great uh, idea for, you know, social media. And then uh, after a couple years of selling only in ABC stores, uh, we started our tasting room. Um, and it was about half the size of what it is now when we started it. Um, but she had this vision of, of how she wanted it to look. And so my dad and I just had to keep writing the checks uh, <laughs> to make sure it it secured her vision. Um, but she has a great eye. She made the place look really, uh, really attractive, really great place to come sit down and, and have a cocktail, which is, you know, the goal. We wanted to be really inviting. Well, it, it kind of has that, that feeling of, you know, that old cocktail lounge, that, yeah. that ambiance that I love. Yeah. Well, tell me a little about Ironclad. I, obviously, that's a it's an old Civil War history kind of thing. And the flight of bourbon of, of whiskeys you have here actually is shaped <laughs> like an Ironclad. <laughs> I'm excited right. to learn about where that came from. Good eye. You know, not everyone gets that. Um, so yeah, the idea, the the story behind the Ironclads, March 9th, eighteen sixty two. Uh, the first ever battle between two Ironclad ships took place, um, and it took place, you know, about maybe half a mile from here. Oh wow! Uh, we would actually had a front row seat at this spot to watch the whole thing go down. So when we were kind of picking names of of what we wanted to do or what, what we wanted to name the distillery. Um, we, you know, we had a couple ones. We, we wanted to have something to tie in with, with Newper news. And, um, the one thing we, you know, we came up with was our, was let's name it ironclad. If, if it's our, if it's already, you know, we would have had a front row seat to watch the whole thing go down. Um, and so, you know, doing that, then we ended up getting to know the really history, the, all the real history of the ironclad ships. Um, I've been inside the, uh, the turret of the monitor, um, uh, gotten to do some really cool things. Um, because it was the first ever battle between two ironclad ships. It changed naval warfare forever. Right. Um, and so with that, we, we thought we'd, we'd, you know, we'd do our branding of you get a little history with your whiskey when you drink ironclad. So it's, I like to say when you're, when you're drinking ironclad, you, uh, you're getting a history lesson. And so it's not, you know, it's not drinking. It's just history. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I tell my, my parents when they ask me what I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> or my wife, I should say. <laughs> All those bottles on my shelf, they're history. Yeah. <laughs> but no, uh, I know that, is it all the bottles or some of the bottles? Yeah, it's actually like there's a peel away on yeah, the label. So on a few of them, there's, there's a peel back. Um, and then there's one of them that's that's printed on the inside. But uh, so on our small batch label, if you peel it back, um, it's got a blueprint of the USS monitor underneath it. On our straight bourbon, um, which is the first one on your right, uh, it's got a peel back of the CSS Virginia. Um, on our bottled and bond label, um, it, if you peel back, peel back that one, it's got the story of, uh, the bottled and bond act. Wow. Um, and then on our monitor blend, which is our high weeded bourbon, um, that one's got the, uh, advertisement from the 1890s of a rye whiskey brand made in New York called the monitor blend. So we just thought it was super cool that, uh, we're not the first people thinking about naming a distillery after ironclad ships because it, it had already been done. Yeah. That's so neat. Yeah. That's yeah, education with each drink. I love it. <laughs> uh, what, so I know you, you, you said, you mentioned that, you know, you're, you have to let this stuff age before you sell it, obviously. So were you sourcing anything in the meantime or did you let, you, you do any white spirits to sell? This is, this is definitely not the way you want to start a business. Um, we were very lucky. We survived. Um, <laughs> but we, oh, our opening of the distillery, we said we were only going to make bourbon. We were never going to make any clear spirits, no vodkas, no gins, no unaged whiskey. Um, and so we waited, uh, wow. for about a year and a half from the, when we made our first, our first barrel to selling our first bottle was just about two years. Um, and so, yeah, we, we waited all that time of just keep producing bourbon, keep producing bourbon, not selling anything. And then eventually, uh, trying it, getting it ready and bottling it and sending it off, uh, but yeah, not not what I recommend at all. Um, there was a lot of nights of ramen, um, but we uh, luckily survived, and yeah, now we're in year nine, almost year ten. Yeah, well, kudos to that. I mean, I, that's that's part of the, what I love doing. Uh, you know, coming out and talking to people like you who are really bootstrapping themselves, and 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 it's part of that TLC, right? It adds to that you have hands on this this craft that you've poured your blood, sweat, and tears into. Yeah, probably literally. <laughs> and, um, 
Uh, does you think that goes into the spirit that, that the quality of the spirit that that story uh, that, that your background and, and what you did to make it get here adds to the uh, the quality of the spirit? I mean, I think it definitely leads to the fact or is makes it, you know, it's it's our own. It, it's it, the, what we're going through with this is this is as much of a King family bourbon as you're going to get. Um, you know, we my dad will help me in the distillery. My sister's helping the distillery. Um, we all have a hand in making it. And so it's it's truly um you know this is uh, this was what we wanted to make and this is uh how I mean, it's it's progressed through the years of i mean it, the mash bill's been the exact same um but we've gotten more mature we've gotten older we've got we've changed tweaked things here and there to make it uh, as best as it can be and so that's that's kind of our goal is we want to be able to make the best bourbon yeah how much trial and error was there when, in the beginning when you were i mean were you self-taught were you yeah so um we started with one 26 gallon still okay. um so that was the hillbilly still <laughs> uh thinking that, that was there was you know oh we're we're big time we're gonna be we're gonna be really cranking out some bourbon uh to fill one fifty three gallon barrel it took us over a month to fill a fifteen it was about a week um and so you know we're like all right this is this is going pretty slow let's go to kentucky let's let's just see what it's like and so we go to Kentucky we walk to our first distillery, which I believe was uh willet or um God, boy, it was either Willet or uh, Heaven Hill. Okay. And we walked in and I just noticed they were spilling uh, more than we were making in a day uh, <laughs> on the first, you know, hour. Uh, so I was like, oh boy, uh, we're not even close to big time. And so <laughs> then we went back to the drawing board. We're like, okay, well, what are we going to do here? So um, we bought five more stills just like the 26 gallon still because um, we read the book, uh, the, Gu the Guide to Urban Moonshining, which was written by Colin Spolman, who is the uh, master distiller and owner of Kings County Distillery right. in Brooklyn. And so he wrote this book explaining how to distill, um, explaining how they started, explaining the history of, of bourbon. And um, and so we started, the, we thought, all right, if, if they can do it that way, then let's let's follow in their footsteps. Um, so then we ended up getting actually go up to Kings County um, in, uh, in Brooklyn and actually got to talk to Colin Spolman. And we had a really nice, you know, few hour conversation up there um, we brought up some stuff that we made that he could try that he could try. Uh, he thought we were doing a good job, which was a really you know amazing thing to, validation that he, that he thought we were doing something right. Right. Um, and then we saw how he expanded and, and what what he is what he was up to at that point. And so, like, OK, great. You know, this is I guess this is our aspiration of what we want to grow to. But let's see where we get to. Uh, let's see how we can get there first. Uh, so we were running the uh, six twenty six gallon stills. We were now filling a 53 gallon barrel in like a week and a half. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> now we can really lay down some whiskey. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we started majority of what we were doing was all 15s. Um, and we were doing about two 53 gallon barrels a year. Uh, and so just kind of slowly ramping up more, running that more and more. And then realizing that if we really wanted to make this market viable, we were going to have to buy a bigger still. And so that's where we sold off all the the fifteen or twenty six gallon stills and bought a five hundred gallon still. So we've had Ruth; um, she's been back there for almost five years now. Um, or almost, I guess about a little over four years now. Um, and now we're doing a now when we first got her, uh, we had a we were doing a fifty three gallon barrel every run. Wow. Um, and so now we're up to the point where we're doing we're laying down about eight barrels eight fifty threes a week as opposed to one fifty three gallon barrel in a week and a half. So um, it's definitely been great laying down more bourbon as opposed and actually having stuff to hold back. Because um, when we first started with the, with the 26 gallon stills, it was uh, everything that we were making was going out the door, which is great. I mean, that's exactly what you want to do. Right. But unfortunately, it didn't give us the the ability to hold back anything. So, you know, we, we do tours now. We're almost 10 years old. They're like, oh, where's the 10-year-old barrels? I was like, they're gone. <laughs> those, those left a long time ago. Uh, and, I, you know, that was great it, it, that uh, that people were enjoying our bourbon and it, and people were buying it. Um, but at the same point, it, it, it was, you know, in the fact that it held us kind of back a little bit and set us back a little bit um, because we couldn't uh, have any barrels that we could just kind of sit back and, like, wait on. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was a good and bad thing, but... Uh, now we definitely are be able to, we have barrel, I, I have barrel up there that's going to make it to 15 years. I don't know which barrel it is, but it'll make it there. Right. 
Hey, when you when you first were doing that in the, in the 15 and then up to the 53 gallon, was there a sweet spot you found for aging that or what, were you chasing the shelf being empty? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, you know, when we started, uh, all of our barrel, all of our barrel storage was on the first floor. Uh, so it was right off. Uh, if you go into the distillery right off where uh, now where all of our ferment- fermenters are, um, that was where all of our barrel storage was. And after about six, eight months of, of real of, with the 626 gallon stills, uh, we almost filled that room. Mm. And so uh, and there was a pretty quick turnover. So, you know, we'd, we'd go we'd fill a row. We'd empty a row, we'd fill a row, empty row. And so we we had a pretty quick turnover there, um, but uh, we had the entire third floor open. And so when we bought Ruth, um, the third floor started getting all the barrels. And then about halfway through this year, all the barrels on, uh, in the first floor went up to the third. Floor. And so now all of our barrels are up there. Um, I have kind of got a nice spot where I, I really love the stuff I'm I'm waiting on and I, w- I want to get the best opportunity. Um, there's a bunch of windows on the back of the building and um, it, there's two specific spots where it gets a lot of sun sunlight throughout the whole day. And so that's that's kind of the spot where I like to leave things. Awesome. So uh, a couple months ago, three months, four, three or four months ago, uh, Tony Hawk came here and so i saw that on instagram he yeah. signed a bottle yeah so he signed a bottle for us um but he also we, we have a thing where if you go up to do a, if you do a tour of the distillery if you go up to the barrel room um and you find your barrel that, a barrel that has your birthday on it you get to sign the barrel oh. so we had a barrel from may 12th uh made this year um so as soon as tony hawk signed that barrel it moved over to the best the best aging spot and so now it's sitting there uh you know for it's not, it's not even a year old yet, so it'll be sitting there for a while. But yeah, now it's you can get to see Tony Hawk's signature on, on a barrel. Oh, that sounds like a great marketing opportunity yeah. down, the, down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I did promise him a few bottles out of it, so. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Very cool. So uh, let's start with the whiskey. What yeah, yeah. Uh, what should I start with? So start on your right-hand side. So the, that first one is our straight bourbon. So this is our flagship mash bill. It's our four-grain mash bill. So 70% corn, 10% wheat, 10% rye, 10% malted barley. Um, and so this one is a hundred proof, uh, about three and a half years old in 53 gallon barrels. Um, it's, you know, nice and oaky on the front, nice little cinnamon pop, little baking spice on the back end. Um, and this is the one that, you know, this is our flagship mash bill. We we've been working the same mash bill since day one. We've actually never changed that. Wow. Um, but you know, we've, we've changed our yeast a couple times. We've changed our barrel char a couple times. We've gone up from uh, 15s and 30s to only, to almost exclusively 53s, um, and so this is just our, uh, you know, this is our ode to bourbon. Like this is this is our kind of flagship. If you're gonna look at where to start with Ironclad, I always always start you here because this is just where we everything started with this match. Yeah, that that finish is a cinnamon bomb. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Wow. What was the proof on this? Hundred. Hundred proof. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good. It's a good benchmark bourbon. Yeah. A good intro to what you guys do. Uh, is this your best seller? Uh, so our best seller, it, it kind of splits between two. Our, our small batch is the most widely available. Okay. Um, so that is the younger version of this one. Um, it's, but it's, it's the most widely available. So it makes it, it's not the most, <laughs> the number one seller. Uh, we did recently get this into ABC stores. Um, uh, and so it, it's, it does, uh, do, it does well. Um, but it's, it's, yeah. Small batch has got a, got a head start on it. Yeah, I will say that the market has been kind of weird in the last ten years, and you're you're kind of growing up in it. That the bourbon is selling as the, the number one thing. People hear the word bourbon, they think, "Oh my god, it's amazing." Yep. Um, rye is slowly kind of creeping back. Yeah. I think there was an uptick of like five percent in the last year, which is cute. But like, what are do you have any plans to uh, go outside of bourbon? Once the is there any room for growth there, or are you going to stay staunch on we are the bourbon guys? So uh, last March. Uh, so March 2023, uh, we released our first ever rye. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, it was called Betrayal um, because for about a year and a half, my sister had no idea that we made a rye. Uh. Um, and so it wasn't until I was talking to someone, to, you know, in the tasting room, they were saying, oh, you, you know, would you are you ever going to branch out? Are you ever going to make anything else? And I said, well, yeah, actually, I have a rye aging upstairs. Um, and I, I think I'm going to let it go for about two, a little over two years for the first release. 
Uh, and then I hear my, my sister per, ears perked up and goes, you did what? And I was like, oh, whoops, I forgot I didn't tell her that. <laughs> and she goes, you betrayed me. I was like, well, all right, that's what we're going to call it. We're going to call it betrayal. And so that was our, so our rye is called betrayal. It's a, it's a, and the rye um, is a four grain rye actually. So it matches the bourbon mash bill exactly. So it's, except split, it swaps the rye and the corn. So it's 70% corn, or rye, uh, 10% corn, 10% wheat, 10% malted barley. Wow. And um, I don't know how many four grain ryes there are, are there are out there, um, but it's, it's minty. It's good. I really like it. That's great. That's yeah. great. Is it still available? Is it's it- not. So it, we only release it once a year. Okay. Um, we, I do. I only run it uh, or mash it and, and distill it a few times during that throughout the year. Whenever my farmers get in, we use a Brutzi rye. Um, our family, uh, our my mom's family is from Abruzzi, Italy. So we we got that rye uh, made or grown for us. Um, and so, yeah. So I, whenever that comes becomes available, uh, I'll grab as much as I can. We'll run it for a couple weeks and then we'll we go back to bourbon. Um, we do we do a whole bunch of different bourbons, so uh, we have to make sure that still stays number one. Of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, tell me about the grain stuff too. I, you you were saying you know you got a farmer. Is it is that local? Are all yeah, your things? Yeah. So uh, we the one thing that we the the reason we're a four grain bourbon and the reason uh, the reason I was going for that is because I really wanted to showcase showcase Virginia ag- agriculture, um, and so we. All of our corn comes from about an hour away from the distillery, either in Charles City or West Point. Um, and then uh, all of our wheat comes from either Charles City or West Point. All of our rye most likely comes from West Point. Um, or uh, all the all the Abruzzi rye comes from, or the, comes from Culpepper. Um, the only thing we don't source from Virginia is our malted barley. Okay. Um, most of that is just... Uh, it, we don't really view uh, malted, bar- uh, malted barley as a... Uh, flavoring agent for it so we were just looking for the enzymes to make that conversion um and so we have used some virginia malt in the t- in the in, in a various few things um but we don't exclusively use that um but yeah so the reason i wanted to showcase virginia, virginia agriculture is because virginia makes grows great grains yeah um and so uh this next one i actually have for you this is a good good transition piece <laughs> is our uh oh, it's called our old kernel and so this one is made with an Indian corn that we get from the eastern shore of Virginia. Um, the Indian corn itself is, you know, red, purple, blue, white, uh, yellow. It's got all the colors of the rainbow. And the corn itself is really naturally sweet. Um, so it is way different than what yellow corn is. Um, and yellow corn is great. It makes super tasty bourbon. But yellow corn is made to be efficient. It's made to be, you're going to get the best yield out of it as possible. Right. This Indian corn is not. It is, <laughs> it is, they can, they can date it. They dated it back. The first time it grew in Virginia was 1865. Wow. Um, and the, the corn itself is just not efficient. Our yield drops by 10 to 15% when we're making this, but the flavor you get out of it is so different, so unique and so, I mean, I wouldn't say better, but I mean, so I mean, those different and unique are are great adjectives for this, um, because it it's just the way probably corn was distilled back in the 1800s, um, and so it's more oily, more viscous, uh, but it's it's just so different. So this one, mash bill, and this one, 78 percent corn, uh, because we really wanted that to be the showcase of the bourbon, um, but the corn is also very sweet, so we wanted dial, uh, we didn't want it to be 100 percent corn, so. 78 corn, 12 rye, 10 malts of barley. Uh, the rye's in there just add a little spice. Uh, this one in particular is the first ever batch that was bottled a month. So it's actually 100 proof and over four years old. Wow. You know, uh, different and unique is, or, or, I mean, that's that says it all right there. But th- this to me drinks closer to almost like a single malt. It yeah. has that, it's really that mouth feeling that's very, almost like a cocoa chocolatey on the, on the tongue. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. That's cool. And then one of the things I love about this too, is because you are a craft distiller, you get to play around here and kind of do what you want, especially as you've grown that you can say, I'm going to try that different corn and do different things. And, you know, tell me a little bit about that experimentation. How fun is it to do that stuff? That is by far the best part of the job. I mean, (laughs) uh, making, uh, making our four grain recipe is great. You know, it's, it's, uh, but at at the same point, it gets a little office spacey, um, (laughs) where you're, you're sitting around and, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. You know, it's like doing TPS reports. Uh, (laughs) this is where we get to experiment and have some fun. So, you know, when we, I'm trying different corns, which I, I've so we, you know we do the Indian corn, 
Uh, I've got one going this week. It's called Wapsi Valley Corn, um, oh. which is supposed to be a uh, another heirloom uh, varietal. Um, it's supposed to be very different. Um, it's so far mashed really well. Uh, we have a Hickory King Corn, which is a really big kernel, a really big white kerneled corn. Mm. Um, we've done Bloody Butcher this year. Uh, well, I've done another heirloom varietal. So we've got about five or six different uh, heirloom corns that we're trying out and different mash bill for each one of them um, to kind of match what the corn, um, how, you know, how it should stand up next to the corn, but still have the corn be the star of the show. Right. Um, and then, so yeah, so that, that's, that's the most, I mean, that's the fun part. And then getting to meet these farmers who are growing these grains because they're the ones who are keeping these grains alive. I mean, I, you know, yellow corn's great, uh, but these other corns are, are maybe, be, maybe better, maybe, or at least different. Well, and, and that's that's the thing that people don't think about. I mean, okay, we were just talking about how the bourbon market has exploded. I don't think people know about that that nuance behind the spirit of, you know, there's 17 different types of corn that make different flavors. <laughs> yeah. and that's really unique. How much of that did you learn on the job, or did you come into this knowing uh, that you want to experiment? Or So go, or coming into the job, I had a uh, about four-week-long um, chemistry course in college <laughs> that we got to talk so the first half you had to learn the basics of chemistry you know chemistry 101 the second half of the cl- of the uh course we got to talk or we got to learn what we wanted to learn about so uh the class got to pick and so ha- by chance the class picked brewing and distilling which are the two things i do now <laughs> um and so it was very rudimentary um nothing we knew or nothing super in depth or anything like that but it was enough to give me at least some knowledge of when we started this we, I, I wasn't completely going in 100% blind. Right. Um, and so, you know, we went over brewing. We went over that process and of, of, of brewing and mashing and all that. Uh, and then we went on to the next stage of distilling where it's, you're just boiling off the alcohol from what you brewed. Um, and so that was, that was my rudimentary knowledge. Then, then we read uh, Colin Spolman's book. Then we went and talked to a whole bunch of distillers to kind of, uh, get their idea or get get how they do things and then after that it was just trial and error trial and error trial and error um and so uh i've been really lucky that farmers have reached out to me saying hey i have these corns um that we that we've grown um would you like to try them of course yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm i would love to try that um and so like the the hick the indian corn for the old colonel uh the, he reached out to a whole bunch of distilleries we uh we were the only one to respond and I was said I, after that, I was like, I'd like a exclusivity. I don't want anyone else having this corn. Um, it's so unique, so different. I, I want it all for myself. He's like, great, no problem. So uh, we have now we have that. Uh, the other farmer in, in Culpeper that we get the Hickory King, the Wapsie Valley, uh, our Brutzi. Uh, he grows for a lot of other distilleries. He's done stuff for Ace with Foam, and he's stuff done. He's done stuff for One Eight. Um, and he there's a reason he he, he is what he, he's getting those clients. It's because he's growing beautiful, great grains. Right. Um, and uh, and he's a super nice guy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we really like dealing with him. He likes dealing with us. So we, we like to continue that conversation. I'm sure there's a little bit of a, you know, a uh, here's some bottles from the stuff that you make. Of course. Too, right? so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the, I mean, I, I think that's that's part of his uh, whole idea behind it. He wants to he wants to get some free booze out of it. So, <laughs> like, hey, that's fine. Not a Keep bad growing job. great grains. We're good. We're good with that. That's right. So it was. What's the third one here? So the third one. So we because we're only, we we only do bourbon. Um, we do a lot of finishes. Um, this is the other part of my job that's that's really fun. Um, so this one's our hot honey finish. So this one is our our small batch bourbon finished in a habanero infused honey cask. Um, so we give our barrels uh, to a uh, hot honey guy in Richmond. His name's Ar's Hot Honey, um, and he makes this habanero infused honey. He ages in our used bourbon barrels. Takes the honey out. Uh, we get the barrels back and we put our bourbon back in there. Um, so we're not adding any hot honey or anything like that to it. We're only picking up those new characteristics from aging in the, in the different barrel. Um, and so this one's really cool. Well, you get that honey right up front. And then as it finishes across the back, of your palate, back of your palate, you actually get that capsaicin sensation. And it's not like face melting or anything like that, but it's definitely enough to let you know it's there. And yep. it's definitely not a whiskey burn. It's, it's, it's so different. Yeah. I was going to say uh, a lot of ryes have that kind of it tricks the mind that the, 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 the spice takes over and you think, oh, it's alcoholic. Yeah. This is most definitely a pepper burn. Yeah. But not bad at all. It's yeah. very pleasant. That's wild. 
<laughs> so this one's really fun. So I, I always say this one, if you have a cold coming on in the, in the winter time, <laughs> you make a hot toddy with yeah. this and it's a, it's a guarantee you'll feel better. Uh, you know, you may have to drink a glass or two or, or drink the whole, the whole bottle, but, um, yeah, it'll, it'll solve, it'll, it'll cure whatever's wrong with you. Cause you know what they say is what whiskey can't cure. There's no cure for. That's right. How long is this in the uh, hot honey barrel? So this finishes in the barrel for about six to eight months. Okay. Yeah. So we liked, I mean, I've, I, I've tested it along the way of, of how we've done it. And, um, at three months it's good, uh, but it still can be a little sweet at six months plus it's, it's where you're getting, you're getting a little bit of honey. Um, but you're still getting, but you're also getting all those other, um, all those other flavors where it's not just a cloyingly sweet, a little bit of pepper in the back. Right. Cause the pepper doesn't go away. No, I, I, it really it sits in your throat and yeah. your chest. I love that a lot. Wow. How unique. And I love the fact, cause there's a lot of places out there that are doing infusions and not actually just aging the barrel. Yeah. And I mean, no shame on that, but I love a more pure, this is bourbon and it's aged in a barrel and it's still bourbon. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is the most fun because I get to meet all these really, I can, so with the 15 gallon barrels, we can use really small producers. Right. So we can do a lot of really cool stuff like this guy. Um, I mean, he's a one man band out of Richmond um, and, you know, I, I give him barrels and if, at, at 15 gallons, he can maneuver them and he can do a, you know, a, a three or four barrels at a time. Right. Uh, if I gave him a 53, it, we, I mean, we've had the problem where, the, where he's had a whole 15 gallon barrel of honey crystallized. <laughs> if we gave him uh, a 53 gallon barrel and a whole thing crystallized, one, no one's moving that thing. And two, uh, that's going to be about a thousand dollars of honey that just kind of <laughs> that you can't use anymore. Right, right. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's nice because I get to experiment with with smaller producers. Like you know, we have a coffee roaster in Norfolk that um, that takes all of our uh, takes our used bourbon barrels and they age their coffee beans in there. Right. Uh, so they're picking up all those all those coffee flavors. Are they all they're picking up all the bourbon flavors and then also leaching oil into the barrels as well. So we're picking up all those coffee flavors. So um, it's great for us that we can do experiment a little experiments and try these things out and it's great for them because you know it's also co you know co-branding which is what you're going for that's, that's what i love about what you're doing here is that, and other craft distillers have talked to in the area and i i love to think of it as common almost like a community there you know you you're doing different things than you know Tocton creek is doing than you know a smith bowman whatever you, you you're all kind of part of this virginia and any other state that has craft distillery yeah. it's a family that you're working towards a different a goal of showcasing what virginia has and I love that you get to work with a coffee roaster down the road. Yeah. That's so neat. And it's, you know, co-branding, helping each other out in the community. That's exactly. what makes craft distilling great. And I'm not trying to shame anybody who loves Jim Beam, yeah. but, you know, they're a big corporate monster and that's, <laughs> that's okay. But one of the things I love about this too, is that you, and I'm sure you've, you've, you've experienced this is that every bottle you, you make is going to taste a little bit different. And that's a unique thing about bourbon. People don't understand sometimes. Yeah. And different corn, different corn, uh, you know, growth is going to be different, different years, uh, different seasons. What, how was it rainy? Was it warm? Was it cold? And it just influences all the little flavors that come here. And, and you have that symbiotic relationship with the, the farmer. And I, it's, it's just neat. It's neat that you're doing this. It's, uh, it's by far the best job I've ever had. <laughs> oh, I am. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate you having me here to experience yeah, your job. Of course. What's the last one here? So the last one is our once our, our once a year release. Um, we released this one just before Thanksgiving, um, and it is our Tawny Port cask finish. Ooh. Um, and so this one, you know, the, the port barrels come straight from Portugal. Uh, we went with Tawny because it's the sweetest of the ports. Um, I really wanted that sweetness to complement with the bourbon. And uh, this one, it's leathery, it's tobacco-y, it's raisiny. Um, it's, it's just a... I, I love this one so much because the, the barrels actually, I mean, even though they're shipped over from Portugal, they still come with port still sitting inside of them. Oh, really? And uh, they're still wet. They're not they're not dried out and, and falling apart like some barrels you get are. Uh, but yeah, this one is so much fun. Uh, it's, you know, you don't always want to pair sweet with sweet because bourbon can be sweet. Yep. Um, but sometimes it's complimentary and this this is a perfect compliment to bourbon. Um, Ruby is, you know, a little drier, um, and I, I didn't necessarily want that flavor or drier and fruitier. Uh, I wanted the more sweet leathery notes and I think they come out in spades in this bourbon. Well, the color on that is beautiful too. Yeah. Um, man, I love that. There's a lot of, I'm a big scotch guy too. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, 
hold a gun to my hand, I'd probably say I love scotch more. Yeah. But at doing this and talking to you and other people, I, I've come much more around on bourbon and, and rye and American whiskeys. Um, there's a lot of scotches that have tawny ports yeah. that I love. And now this is this is just a, it, it tastes like a sherry bomb on, almost. Yeah. Um, oh man, I love that. How, so you said that when the bottles come from Portugal, there's still some tawny port left in there. Yeah. Do you have to remove that or do you just throw the bourbon in with it? So we will take that out so that we don't have any flavor, you know, any flavoring, I guess, is what they would, we could classify it. Right. Uh, so yeah, we always take it out. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's, there's like two or three gallons of, of port in there still. Oh, so, so it's not just it, a splash. It's not just a splash. It's, it's still pretty wet, but we take them and we take it out and we put the bourbon back in. And, you know, most likely, uh, if there's still, uh, port sloshing around in there uh those staves are still really wet yeah and so you know even though we, we completely drained it it's still got that absorption of all that so through transference when the bourbon's going in we're picking up all that tawny port which right. is which is what exactly what i want absolutely oh man so tell me what the barrels you're using are you, are you do you have your own cooperage are you uh so yeah so we have uh we use two cooperages almost exclusively um we have one out of missouri um it's called mcginnis um it's a small family run cooperage. Uh, you know, I, I think the dad's still the owner. The son is who we deal with. Uh, and they make 15 gallon barrels and they make 53s. They also make a lot of wine barrels, um, but they're great. They've been around since the, I think the fifties. Uh, we've been using them since day one. Uh, and then uh, a few years ago, uh, I believe it was 2020, uh, Space Side up in, out in uh, Virginia, out in the Western part of Virginia opened up. Uh, and so as soon as they were opened up, we reached out or they reached out to us and sent over a bunch of samples of barrels. And uh, I got to meet the head Cooper. Um, and I, I was, I, I, the, for the longest time I've been looking for a cooperage to make barrels out of Virginia Oak. Right. Uh, because I, you know, I'm, I, I'm very passionate about using Virginia ingredients and uh, our number one ingredient in making bourbon is the barrel. Um, we're getting 70% of our flavor of, uh, just from that barrel. So uh, the one thing I wanted was I wanted that I wanted the Virginia Oak. So I was like, are you using Virginia Oak? He's like 90% of it. Yes. And I was like, done. Wait, wait, <laughs> let's let, uh, let's uh, sign me up or we're taking as many barrels as we can get out of you. And so um, the a lot of distilleries have dealt with um, barrel shortages and everything like that. And we've been very lucky. We were one of the first people to sign up with Speyside. They've been nothing but great to us. They've taken care of us really well. Um, and even when we need a few extra barrels they're they're always there for us. So, um, I, I love their barrels. I think they do a great job. The quality is super great and I'm really enjoying the bourbon that's coming out of them. Yeah. Well, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, how, are you doing, what kind uh, of char level are you doing? So pretty much, uh, we do char number three on almost everything. We do have a few char fours, a couple char fives. Okay. Uh, everything is medium toast as well. So they toast the barrels and then they char them. Um, that's just to kind of, uh, ramp up more oakiness and it penetrates the wood more. Um, so that, that's kind of the idea behind that, uh, to make sure we, we we're getting as much of the oak as out of the barrels as possible. Yeah. Well, I was going to say your, 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 uh, uh, non-finished bourbon, it, it definitely has a good oaky, but a mellow oak. Mm -hmm. It's not, sometimes you get a bourbon that's just, it's, it's over aged in a barrel that's overcharred and it just tastes <laughs> like wood. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not going to name anybody, but, <laughs> <laughs> but. That, that, that oak flavor and those wood sugars can really be pleasant. And I think your your non -fin, un, unfinished bourbons showcase that perfectly. But the finished bourbons, obviously, you're not trying to showcase that wood. But, yeah. But you like the tawny port, that tobacco leather and that leather flavor, I would think, is probably an accent of the wood sugar. It's it's phenomenal. Thank but, you. Yeah. So uh, is there anything else that you can maybe disclose, like any uh, experimentations that you have squirreled away in the back that you're waiting on or is there anything that you want to do that you haven't done yet any beer barrel finishes or i've done a beer barrel finish we have we we released that one last uh we did a belgian quad okay um we do that with uh with our friends over at cashel over in hampton um and we'll have we, i just got the this year's barrels for next year uh in um the things i've wanted to do are a, a, a few different experiments of finishes uh that are like, are they viable? So, like, I'd, I'd love to do a actually tobacco finished bourbon. Ooh. Um, where they age uh, do tobacco for cigars inside the barrel. Uh, we get the barrel back and we put the bourbon and put the bourbon back in. Um, I don't know the legality of that because now we'd be going into tobacco and alcohol. 
Uh, I think it would be available. I think it's able. I don't know. So that's just one of the kind of sticking in the nagging in the back of my mind of, of trying that. Um, I, I'd love to do a chili like or do like a maraschino cherry sort of thing and, and then barrel aged maraschino cherries. I don't know. Uh, these are just ideas that run through my head, but I'm then having to figure out how to actually execute them. That's that's the more difficult part. Yeah, you, you say alcohol and tobacco. I'm pretty sure there's a three letter agency out there that just their, <laughs> their ears sort of buzzing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be neat though. I because it, I've never. I don't think I've seen a tobacco barrel aged. I've seen obviously I've seen cigars aged in a, yeah. a bourbon barrel. That'd be interesting. Really accent those tobacco flavors. Yeah, and I'm a big cigar guy too. So. No, that, that, that's that's kind of the idea of it. I I, they, I guess there there's a um, cigar place down in Nicaragua that's taking a whole bunch of used bourbon barrels and they're they're aging the tobacco inside the bourbon barrels. Yeah, and I was like, how can you? I mean, like, how are they getting the tobacco leaves back out? And then how is a, are they destroying the barrel and doing that? So it's like, oh, I gotta figure out a way. Yeah, maybe that'd be that'd be cool. Yeah, and I know you you did allude to that. There's a uh, an older bourbon that you're uh, hopefully we're gonna release at some point. It's probably a special edition. Uh, so yeah, well, I mean, we we ha- we'll have next year we'll have our first ever six year old bottled and bond. Okay, um, which will be the oldest bourbon we ever released. Um, we'll have more and more. I mean, I have more and more barrels sitting up there that are getting older and older, and so I just gotta have the patience of <laughs> waiting there and letting it get to age and just being patient. That's 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 the part of this that, that makes me <laughs> makes me anxious. Is I, at some point I'd love to get into the business, and I, we have a couple buddies we want to work with, and maybe down the road open up a cigar lounge slash distillery of some sort. But, yeah, uh, sounds great. Yeah, I talked talk to all you guys, and it's like, oh man, that sounds like so much work. <laughs> so thank you for doing it. <laughs> it's gotten a lot easier. I mean, from when we first got all of our paperwork to for uh, to become a licensed distillery, that that took about a year. Now I've heard like you can get it done in like two to three months. Oh yeah, yeah. because it's they've got more employees now as they see the demand. Right. Um. But yeah, so it's definitely gotten a lot easier. Very cool. Well, I I appreciate you sharing your uh, your story and yeah. uh, the whiskey, and I, I'm a big fan. I'm a I'm a I'm a customer, of course. <laughs> but uh, this has been an awesome spot to to come and do a podcast with you. So thank you, Owen. And, thank you, uh, Kogan. Cheers to uh, cheers to Ironclad. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it if you left us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The more reviews, the easier we are to find. Also, if you aren't already, be sure to follow us on social media so you never miss any of our updates. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and always be sure to drink responsibly. There are quite literally thousands of distilleries, so we're just getting started. Stay tuned for more conversations with master distillers, distillery owners, mixologists, and even bar owners, and more. Cheers. Cheers.